G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. I'd like to make a little bit of a movie about the bat eater's disease. The one that's spreading across Africa with Nigeria now a country where people are starting to show up with disease that they have caught in Nigeria. Ever since bloke flew into Nigeria on the 25th of last month and died or maybe he flew in and died on the 25th but he was vomiting on the aeroplane as he was on his way into Nigeria and he died in Lagos hospital and now a nurse at the hospital has died from bat eaters virus so Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Nigeria my most recent copy of New Scientist magazine carries a date the 2nd of August so it was probably actually printed three or five days prior to that. So we can say seven, maybe ten days ago, the death rate or the death toll was 670. Today it's listed on the radio as being over a thousand or almost a thousand, depending on the particular news channel we look at. So you'd have to say that the, the spread of the bat eaters virus is not being contained. The United Nations have convened a special committee to consider whether or not Ebola constitutes a global health emergency. I would suggest that we've actually got past that point. People are arriving via airlines all over the world because they want to get out of Africa because they know that bat eaters disease is loose in Africa and they're turning up in America, in Nigeria, perhaps in Wales and they're putting themselves into voluntary isolation for the 21 days that's the maximum known incubation period for the bat eaters virus, bat eaters disease. Uh, that to me seems a little bit ad hoc and I'd say the ad doesn't hoc to be honest uh, relying on people who are running away from an epidemic to quarantine themselves once they get away from the epidemic it's bullshit you know I mean the incubation period is 7 to 21 days so on an average people can be getting around for 12 days without realizing that they even feel sick then they get the early onset symptoms of just about every upper respiratory tract or gastrovirus that you've ever heard of. Fatigue, dizziness, weakness, muscle aches and pains. Temperature, nausea, and then vomiting and diarrhoea. And it's not until the vomiting and the diarrhoea that the people are considered to be contagious. Now, a shout out here to refried bean dip. Hi Richard, I've really enjoyed your coverage of Ebola and maybe drawing on the stuff that I've read over the years I've been paying attention to the Ebola outbreaks as they've happened maybe I can shed a bit of light on uh, some of the things that are worrying you I don't think there's a conspiracy to try and downplay the deadliness of this outbreak the fact is this outbreak 55% death rate it's a different strain to the one that killed 90%. But there are people who, for sensationalist purposes, or perhaps out of genuine ignorance, they're making movies and news reports saying that the death rate for Ebola varies from 50 to 90%. Others are leaving out the 50% and they're jumping onto the 90%. So there's, there's purveyors of confusion. Perhaps they mean to, perhaps they don't. Makes for a better headline if you talk about a movie... Uh, uh, a virus that kills 90%. I can hear an airy plane flying over here now. Um, so there's that. There's, there's also the issue of droplet contamination or droplet infection. My understanding, Richard, is that although experiments in a laboratory have been done which confirm that if you aerosolize the virus and puff that in the face of a monkey or a ferret, you can give the monkey or the ferret, the Ebola, right? But 
there are no as yet known cases of any human catching Ebola after they've only been sneezed on. So there's no recorded or documented cases or incidents of human to human transmission via droplets. And that's good, that's really bloody good because all you know, the sudden acute respiratory ser uh, syndromes, <coughs> most of your upper respiratory tract infections, they are via droplet transmission. Um, pretty sure pneumonic plague, you know, the black plague, um, that was a droplet business as well as rat bites. Uh, so, in order to actually catch Ebola, what you have to do is nurse somebody who's in the infectious phase where they may or may not recover, and at the moment 45 out of every 100 are recovering, so they have to be given nursing care, but if they vomit on you, and the vomit actually gets onto your skin, if it gets past all the zoot suits you're wearing, you're probably going to catch the disease and have to roll that roulette wheel, you know, 55-45 yourself. My understanding is that the doctor who identified the outbreak in Conakry, who was the first doctor to die of Ebola, he caught his dose of Ebola by selflessly rushing across the room to pick up a patient who'd fallen out of bed. And he picked the patient up and he either got vomited on, bled on, shat on, pissed on, spat on, something. And even though he was wearing the best protective equipment they had at the time on the spot, it was probably only the same sort of stuff that you wear when you're operating in operating theatre. You know, he would have had rubber gloves, he would have had a gown, a hat, a mask, perhaps goggles. But vomit, shit or piss it can go through the fabric of the gown. So you're gonna to have to have a waterproof, synthetic, virus-proof gown, right? Otherwise, if you get the juices on you, you're probably gonna catch the disease and have to fight it off or die. So all the news reports are saying that uh, it's only a disaster in Africa because the rest of the developed world, we have highly capable medical and health industries and you know we can deal with the cost of barrier nursing anybody who goes to a casualty unit and says i've got a temperature and i feel sick yeah we can do that can we i don't think we could pull that one off in australia um since i've been paying attention to it our government has been trying to save money by cutting expenditure on public health they took the student nurses out of the hospitals because oh they didn't want anybody to have apprentices you know on a, on a learn on the job basis treating them in hospital they had to be sent to university and the nurses union was all in favor of that because if we got a university degree then we could get paid like oh lawyers and accountants and everybody else who goes to university so therefore when the university graduates came out of the colleges of nursing at the universities they discovered that uh, they had to work for six months on half pay because they weren't actually any good with their classroom techniques at working on the wards and dealing with real people. <coughs> and then they couldn't get a job even after that because uh, the private nursing homes and the private hospitals didn't want to pay registered general nurses to actually do the nursing. Oh shit, no, it was much easier to have just one of them per ward doing the paperwork and pay assistance in nursing and enrolled nurses aides to run around and deliver the face-to-face -face care. Well I'm 53 and I was the last hospital trained nurse to graduate from Concord Repatriation General Hospital. January 1984, all the nurses that have come through past that date, they all learnt how to fill in paperwork at a university. They're not much good at face-to-face -face nursing. Sorry about that, but you know, I went from being senior student nurse at Concord Repat to sister in charge of the Vegetable Creek Hospital. I had three months of surfing on the beach in between. And I pulled it off. I, you know, I held the job down. I didn't kill any Emavillians. A few of them died, but I didn't kill them. So, <clears throat> yeah, my honest opinion is that Australia is not capable, even with all of our public hospitals 
even with the fact that when somebody gets sick in a private hospital, they then get taken to the intensive care at the public hospital. We don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough beds, we don't have enough supplies and equipment and linen laundry facilities to deal with an outbreak of a virus that's going to kill 55% of the people and all you have to do is get bled on or vomited on or pissed on or spat on or shat on in order to catch the virus. There is no way that our health system is going to cope with that. The only way to deal with it is keep it out. And that would mean making everybody who wants to fly into Australia spend 25 days in quarantine at the airport before they take off to fly to Australia. Anybody who wants to get on a boat ride that's going to take longer than 25 days from their last port of call, that's not a problem. But the incubation period for Ebola is 21 days before you even start to feel sick. 7 to 21, but 21's, it, it's on the board. So, 25 days in quarantine, maybe 28. Okay. Overshoot, give a 25% give a margin for error. What's that going to do to the tourist industry? Cries the Chamber of Commerce. Boo hoo, says the bloke at the motel. Oh, what about the airline shareholders and pilots and cabin staff? The bus drivers, the train drivers, everybody who was planning on making a living by somebody else going on holiday. They won't allow it. They won't stand still for it. They're going to minimise and downplay the potential consequences of a bat eater's disease outbreak in their town until it is too late, until it is happening. Once it's happened, once it's loose in the community, it pretty much is too late. I mean, just put yourself in the position of a husband or a wife, a brother or a sister, a father, a son, a partner, a lover of somebody that you care about who says they feel sick and they just want you to come over and do the washing up for them or make food for them. When they vomit, are you not going to pick up the soiled sheets when they shit themselves? Are you not going to pick it up when they start bleeding from the eyes? Are you not going to nurse them? Huh? Last week I got a text message from one of my children saying, oh, I'm vomiting and diarrhea, I feel really shit, you know, I can't get out of bed. Help, daddy, help. So daddy nurse, you know, picked up the electrolyte replacement tablets and the anti-nausea medication and came in via the supermarket, picked up a little bit of invalid food, you know, nice dry bland biscuits and clear soup. And got up to the sick kids flat and I found when I got there that the kid was so crook they'd been sitting on the toilet and they vomited while they were sitting on the toilet and the vomit was still on the bathroom floor. In hindsight, if I wanted to be squeaky clean about it, I probably should have gone into the kitchen and picked up a used shopping bag for each hand before going in and getting toilet paper to wipe up the vomit from the floor of the bathroom and throw it into the toilet bowl and flush it, what I did do was made sure that none of that moisture touched even my fingertips as I used toilet paper to mop up the vomit from the floor of the bathroom. And after I'd mopped up the vomit, then I used bleach, big healthy dose of it, and I wiped the bleach up. But I left the bathroom floor in a condition where no virus could be surviving. And that was a week ago. So I'm already starting to treat my children's illnesses as possible Ebola when I go to nurse them, right? Doesn't mean I'm going to stop nursing them. As it happened, the kid got better and, you know, was walking around town again the next day. It was a 24-hour gastrovirus. But there's no way on your first approach thinking that it's a 24-hour gastrovirus that you can be sure they're not going to get sicker and sicker and sicker and start bleeding from the eyeballs at the end of a week. Because that's possible. People are highly mobile. People from the town where I live go to the coast for the tourist traps or they go up to the Gold Coast for the tourist traps there or they go down to Sydney and they hit the nightclubs, the night spots. It's not at all unusual or radical 
to be kissing strangers on the spur of the moment in our society. Especially after a little bit of alcohol has been taken on board and the music's really nice, the company's convivial. I think the bad eaters virus is going to go a long way. And of course, we call it the bad eaters virus because that's how you get it. You get it by eating fruit bats. Wouldn't that be right? My understanding of how it came to be in five locations. In Guinea, one in Conakry, four others out in the boonies, separated by 200 miles each from all of them, is that some entrepreneur has got a load of shotguns, a bunch of his mates, a vehicle with a refrigerated container, and they've gone out to a tree and they've shot the bats. Transported the bats in the refrigerated container to the nearest truck roads crossways, you know, where the the diesel powered vehicles that flog backwards and forwards across Africa carrying everything to everywhere that they don't have a railway. Where the truck drivers coalesce at the crossroads, they've gone around selling bush meat. Chilled, freshly shot fruit bats, you know, who wants to buy them? And they've gone off in five different directions. And the people who shot the bats didn't necessarily know that Ebola virus is just like the flu for bats. They get it when they've got uh, a compromised immune system. If they've got a compromised immune system, it generally means that they've been under stress. The best way to stress out a fruit bat colony is to send a whole bunch of people from an expanding human population into the forest and cut down all of the high value trees that the fruit bats would have otherwise eaten and lived on while they were pollinating all the trees in the forest that the insects don't do. Fruit bats are pretty vital to forest ecology and the health of the trees. So anyway, uh, when the shotgun equipped entrepreneurs approach on the ground, the bat has obviously an observer guard posted. The warning is given, all the healthy bats in the colony say, oh, humans are coming, they've probably got guns, let us fly away, and they fly away. If the humans are really organized, they'll be coming in from multiple directions and the bats will have to fly over the anti-aircraft barrage to get out. So some healthy bats might get shot down, but mostly the ones that are still on the tree when the humans walk up underneath, they're the ones who are too sick to fly. So they're the ones who get shotgunned by the entrepreneurs and then chilled and then carried out. And they're the ones that have got the disease. And if you are butchering an infected bat, get its body fluids on you, congratulations. The disease dissolves the connective tissue in the capillaries of your blood vessels and your arterial walls. That's how come you get the bleed through your eyes and your ears and you know, into your internal organs. That's why if the juices get onto your skin, it'll go straight through the skin. So eating bats is a really bad idea. It's as bad an idea as kissing camels, you know, Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome. It's a virus that the bats have given the camels and the people who've got lots and lots and lots of lovely camels go up and kiss the camels and they get Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, which is just barely droplet transmissible from human to human. Wait until it meets a chook from Hong Kong, I guess. Uh, here in Australia, we have horse kisses disease. Again, pressure on the bats caused by failed farmland on the outskirts of cities in southeast Queensland. Anywhere where there are fruit bats in remaining patches of forest in northern New South Wales on the coastal fringe, the failed farms are cut up by the real estate agents and sold to refugees from the suburbs who've sold their McMansion and they don't want to sit in a Winnebago driving around National Highway Number 1 until it's time to go into the funeral director's holding paddock, aka the nursing home. What they want to do is go and buy a little patch of land and cut down all the trees except one in a paddock as a shade tree and they want to indulge their racehorse fantasy until their money runs out. Or oh, maybe it's a coursing horse or perhaps it's a trotting horse or maybe they want to take the grandchildren to pony club or maybe they didn't get to go to pony club when they were in their infancy therefore in their dotage they want to buggerize around with horses but the point is you wind up with bats under pressure in freshly deforested country in a drought and they will come over to the only tree they can find which is the shade tree in the toy farmer's paddock and then the bats 
shit on the ground that the horses are eating, the horses get the Hendra virus, for which there is a vaccine. But it's expensive. Right? It might cost some hundreds of dollars for the first year and, you know, a hundred bucks a year after that per horse. And the people who are trying to make a living out of their horse fantasy, they can't afford it. I heard one bloke talking about how he had maybe 30 horses and to vaccinate all these horses, it was going to be a $14,000 impost, which was going to stop his business from being able to break even, let alone turn a profit. So he wasn't going to vaccinate his horses against horse kisses disease. He was just going to keep a whole lot of isolation suits on hand so that any horse that gets sick, any time he calls the vet, he says to the vet, oh, by the way, the horse is not vaccinated. Climb into your antiviral suit and I'll give you the suit while you go over and talk to the horse. The vets are getting to the point where they're not interested in working on horses unless they're vaccinated. So there's, an, there's a standoff there. Maybe the United Nations Committee that's meeting to discuss whether Ebola is in fact a global health emergency, maybe that'll give everybody a shake up on horse kisses disease, camel kisses disease, as well as bat eaters disease. In the meantime, read up on barrier nursing, because believe me, when your kid or your neighbour gets sick, you're going to want to know a little bit about what goes on. How you can care for somebody without getting anything on you from them. And this is not reverse barrier nursing where you're stopping yourself from giving them something because they've got no immune system because you know you're doing a bone marrow transplant or a cancer treatment. This is barrier nursing. This is old fashioned, you know, how do you deal with typhus and the plague and things that you don't want to catch while you're busy delivering basic nursing care, rehydrating the person, keeping them clean and comfortable and hoping that their own immune system can cope with whatever the fuck it is that's wrong with them. Because medical science is scratching its head at this point. I think it was an understandable act of hubris for the American health system to say, oh, these are American citizens with a disease, they are not simply a virus risk. And they've brought people back into America to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia. And they're gonna try and do their best to use their latest, greatest, wouldn't it be nice if drug. And maybe it'll work. And maybe none of the nurses will contract the virus. And if they contract it, maybe they'll go straight into isolation and maybe the doctors will go straight into isolation. Um, perhaps. The latest I heard in one of the four African countries, I can't recall whether it was Sierra Leone, Guinea, Liberia or Nigeria, the doctors have gone on strike. <laughs> that gives you an idea of where things are headed. Up shit creek in a barbed wire canoe with a matchstick for a paddle and the only way that we've got any hope as a, as a species of preventing the spread of the virus is to shut down airlines for anybody who has not stood a 28 day quarantine period. So considering the airline shutdown is not going to happen, you better get used to barrier nursing. And try very, very hard not to get bled on or vomited on or spat on. Um, hope that clears things up for you, Richard, and anybody else who's interested. Um, by the way, Richard, I've been really impressed with your coverage of the Ebola virus. Um, you've been doing a more up-to-date, better job of keeping me informed than ABC Radio National, and that's that's saying something. That's that's a big feather in your cap. Everybody else, pay attention. Look up barrier nursing. Read up about it. Think about how you might improvise something to be able to keep yourself away from somebody's secretions while you are giving them basic nursing care. Right? Because the only other op option is to say to somebody, oh, you are sick, nurse yourself, get better if you can, I'm running away because I'm not going to come near you. And uh, Richard, is anybody taking bets on whether Obamacare will be reduced? to putting suspected Ebola cases in the FEMA camps and leaving them to nurse themselves. Because that's my bet. That's where I think this is going. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.